Amen. So let's uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts eight, and uh, this is interesting portion of Scripture. Eight verses twelve through seventeen. Say Amen when you're there. Amen. How many's got your sword with you tonight? Yes. Can't hard to fight a battle without your sword. Amen. Are you ready? But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. It's a normal sequence of events that needs to happen, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says in parenthesis there, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it says, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So we have our have an altar service there, an altar call there where they came forward and they laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Ghost. Let's set our Bibles down. Let's go before the Lord. Jesus, we love you. We need you. Your word declares that everything needs to be done decently and in order and you are not the author of confusion. I pray God tonight that you allow me to impart this teaching. It's imperative. It's needful. We find it in the book of Acts, how to conduct ourselves when people need the, the plan of salvation, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Ghost. Help us, God, tonight as this teaching goes forth in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Altar work not only involves working with people in the altar, but they have a burden to see the work of God propagated. They want to see the kingdom of God go forward. It's going to be hard to be an altar worker if the work of God is not important to you. That being said, God has instructed the church to be workmen, 2 Timothy 3.15. God is not inclined to use lazy or, let me use another word, comfortable people. Mm -hmm. David was keeping sheep when he was called. Elisha was plowing with 12 head of oxen. Gideon was threshing grain. Disciples, many were uh, working with their nets. It's very clear that when the, God, when the call of God came to them, they were involved in working and being busy. And everybody has a place in the work of God. In fact, you'll find if you read and, 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 and study that your salvation is directly predicated on understanding this and working diligently. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says, Whatsoever the hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is not, no, there is not work in the grave where you go. So what's the, you got to work hard now. You got, you got to get after it now. You there's no on the other side. Well, let me go back. Oh no, you 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 better, you better, you better get some corn in your crib now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In fact, Paul speaking to Timothy in chapter four, verses one through five, he says, "I charge thee therefore before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom shall judge the quick and the dead is appearing, and His kingdom preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine." For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You have to understand, God never intended for people to be off on their own with their own little doctrine, their own understanding. That's why he's given you pastors and teachers and evangelists and all these things. That's, that's like taking your thumb, cutting it off, throwing it in the corner. It's all right. It's a thumb all by itself. No, it's got to be a part of a body. You know, you understand if, if something doesn't work, you ever notice? You ever bang your thumb? What do you do? The other hand takes care of it. 
I'd like to see y'all get ready for church without using your hands. The feet cannot do it by themselves. Aren't you glad you aren't brushing your teeth with your feet? Aren't you glad you're not having to eat with your feet? Mm-hmm. It's a good thing you got a mouth because your nose will be having a hard time swallowing some of them bits of steak y'all be chewing on. So you need to be a part of a body. God, God's coming for a church. You got to be a part of a church. He goes on. And he talks about sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction. Listen, and he says this in the end. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. It's imperative, imperative that a Christian can function in an evangelistic type mode in an altar. Understand that what's going on at this moment in the altar, Satan is aware that he's a, a potentially about to lose a person from his fetters of deceit. The altar is a, a very important place, especially when you're dealing with hell, demons, spirits, people's attitudes. You see, a lot happens at an altar. Don't think, oh, man, the altar is awkward. No, people are awkward. The altar is a wonderful place. Understand. Understand what's going on there. And so Satan's aware, I'm a, I might lose somebody here. So he's going to use every form of distraction, any tactic he knows to keep a person bound. An altar is a place where you get set free. So on the other side, Jesus is ready to give the person the Holy Ghost a healing, a miracle, deliverance, drawing him through love, conviction. Conviction's not a bad thing. Conviction's a wonderful thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It, 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 I, I want the Holy Ghost to convict me now so I don't have consequences of it later. Conviction's great. Consequences are a problem. <laughs> okay, can you hear what I'm saying? All right. So an altar worker is the front line of spiritual warfare. When you come up here and you're, you're working with people, you're, you're, you're the Navy SEAL of the church because to throw yourself in that environment, you better be spiritually inclined. And it's at that moment that the altar worker will many times, if you think about it, cast the deciding vote or tip the scales on what takes place in the battle over a soul if victory is to be won or lost. It's an awesome responsibility. So when it comes to a church service, it's imperative that we have good pre-service prayer. Look, if you're going to be a part of the altar call, I don't think blowing off pre-service prayer bodes too well. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We do our best to have good music and worship, and we're all involved in that, and you know, we, we're all doing our best to learn to how to do announcements without preaching. We uh, take up a timely offering and hopefully are preaching and teaching. And, man, we've had some good preaching and teaching. I'm so thankful for our preachers that we've had come through here. Amen? But in, on, in all honesty, if I'm to be honest about some things, if you step back and look at most churches today, the most neglected part of the service, in fact, it's pretty much omitted in some denominations today, which, which is, is, is ridiculous. The most neglected is really the most important. It's often rushed, overlooked, and even disregarded. And it's the altar service. It's the time at the altar, the altar call, because the altar call is the moment where we respond to what happened and what we took care of in pre-service prayer. It's where we respond and act after worship and the preaching of the word. And it's where we take and react to what we've just heard, the message we've just been given. It's our moment to respond. It's the moment that all things done prior have culminated to produce that moment of an altar. How can we just sweep through or rush through the altar? It's very noticeable that the altar is often neglected. And I want to I want to teach this because I want to in, improve and give God a greater opportunity and a person come in seeking healing, a miracle. And he, well, we need to know how to do this. 
We just can't say, well, that's somebody else's job. That's not biblical. What if it's just you and somebody else and they have a need? Well, oh, can't help you there. That's not biblical. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Observation is the first level of revelation. I've learned to observe. You have to observe. Don't ask people things. Watch their life. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Observe. Observe. Now, now I'm pastor. I do watch to see what time you walk in here. And yes, I know what's important to you, and I know what's not. Go ahead and judge me. I already judged you. It's all fair. If you don't think prayer is important, don't come to me about things we need to do around here. As if your conversation with God is not important, I don't think what you have to say to me is going to hold a whole lot of weight. Did you hear what I just said? Did you get that? Okay. It's funny. We'll be attentive. We'll be on time for our doctor's appointments. But we'll, pre-service prayer, eh, dentist appointment, chiropractor, shopping, we're on time for that. We'll go mosey on in here 10, 15, 20 minutes after. Are you hear what I'm saying? So I'm observing. Who's praying? Who's yawning? Oh, it's an altar call. Who thinks it's, oh, altar call's time for me to go to the restroom. Who's mad? Who's talking? Who's looking at their phone? Who's paying attention and who's distracted? Now, I know I've stepped on some toes there. Sadly, I do have some people in mind when I say that. Don't get mad at me. I'm trying to be a good pastor. I can't point out to you what you're doing right. You're doing right there. i got to point out what you're in danger of. What, you tell your kids to, uh, 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 they're going to take the car and go out? What do you say? Be reckless. Take chances. Disobey the speed limit. No. Hey, be safe. Watch what you're doing. Keep the door locks when, when you're driving down the road and you come to it. We got to point out things you need to take care of. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'll never forget a new pastor telling the story of the first altar call. I was at a home mission seminar years ago and we were getting up and telling church horror stories. And this guy uh, he's preaching, he's preached his guts out. Brand new church, he's just trying to get things going and he's just, just preached his guts out and he makes an invitation to the altar. And it did like about what you just did there. No one moved. So he preached a little bit more and he's just preaching his guts out. I mean, he's giving all he's got and he goes ahead and, 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 and opens it up again. And they do like what, about what you're doing to me right now. So he preached a little more and then again invited folks to come to respond to the message. And again, no one moved and it was a sticky silence. He lowered his head. He did all he knew. No reaction from the congregation. And it was pretty humiliating. And then to add insult to injury as he was looking down about like this, stared at the empty altar. And he said a cockroach walked out from the seats and came walking right down the center aisle towards the altar. <laughs> He's, I mean, I could probably tell it better if it was my story. Sadly, I, I mean, thankfully, I haven't had that happen yet. <laughs> it's safe to say, if we're honest tonight, that many of our churches and sometimes Souls Harbor have weak altar calls. The ministry in the altar is suspect and lacking. I do want to say I'm thankful for those of you I can point at and, and direct around, but I love the day to come when you're so in tune in the spirit, you're way ahead of me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, the altar is supposed to be full of power, deliverance. We're supposed to experience miracles and watch people get the Holy Ghost. 
but we find because that's what it's supposed to be, we'd rather avoid it. But if you think about church, we do everything to create an environment for an appointment with a holy God only to miss or ignore our responsibility to do a part. We did all that for that moment. You see, when it's time to come to an altar, when the altar call is given, when it's time to stand, let's all come. Go! Well, I ain't got nothing to pray for. But you got someone to pray with. And if, if you don't have someone to pray for, and if you don't have something to pray for, you should pray that I should have someone to go up there and pray for. I should have a need that's urgent. I should have. We got a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. We got teenagers facing crazy things, and you don't need to come to an altar. Whoa, I think there's something that's, I think maybe we need to lay hands on you. You need to be in the altar. When it's time to respond, when we've done everything and, and, and what, did you really get all dressed up for nothing? If we're going to get dressed up, if you're going to take a shower and if you're going to come on to church and you're going to be in prayer and you're going to listen to the preaching and you're going to worship or say, my God, when they all, we ought to all, that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Nothing worse than showing up on the job and you get that new guy because he's got his brand new two belt. Shiny new hammer and got a new boots on. He's the new recruit. And we start calling him Wonder Bread because he's an eight-hour loaf. All show and no go. It don't really matter if you got the uncut hair, ladies, but you can't come to an altar. It don't matter if you talk about all this holiness and all this belief and all that. If you just think the altar can be neglected or relegated, oh, that's my cue to go to the bathroom or check my phone. I wonder, well, can I say this? If we're judged by every idle word and what we do with our hands, because it says to do it with all your might, how's that going to fare when we stand before God when someone's up here or someone needed someone up here and they didn't have anybody to pray with them? Can I say that? Don't be hard to move. Let's all give the Lord a hand praise. Stop, stop. It's as easy as that. It's as easy as that. There's somebody up here. It, you, it'd be wonderful if you're so full of the Holy Ghost and ready to lay hands on them and the sick recover. But you know what? If you're not even willing to come up and lay hands on them, how can they? All God needs is a starting point. Let's not be a, the, the kind of church that's difficult to move in the spirit. Let's not be a people that's blocked God from moving in. Let's create an environment. Let's purposely be responsible for when it's time when, it, when it's time to clap, we clap. When it's time to worship, we worship. When it's time to praise, we praise. When it's time to sing, we sing. When it's time to stand and turn our Bible. But when it's time to altar call, we need to do that with the same unity. Now, you can look around and some of us have been around church a little while. You know what's going on. After the preaching, you know what's next. <laughs> you know what the minister are preaching. We've had some great guest preachers, and, 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 and we've watched what goes on, and we know exactly what they're working towards. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? You know exactly what's going to happen when he's done preaching. We're working all the singing and the worship and the prayer and the fasting and the Bible studies and the teachings and all that and all that's going on. And when you come to the music, and they come to the music and they try to find it, they work to find the right song and they want to, never want to hit the note. They never want to hit the note. Why? Because we want an altar moment and a move of God. We ought to just be as in tune as getting to that altar and being a part of what God and everybody's trying to do. You know what's expected. Flow with it. Move with it. Get in tune with it. When it's time to go to the altar, let's all come to the altar and pray. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't check your phone. Don't look at the time. Can I tell you, trust me, every minister knows what time it is. 
the altar is the emergency room. It's the birthing center. Get down there. Come down there. Find someone who needs you. Someone who just needs to feel the gentle touch of a faithful hand upon their shoulder. Someone, someone that that where two or three can, can gather and agree together. Someone that you've been praying at pre-service prayer. In fact, you pray every day and you read your Bible and you come walking in here in faith and you care and you're concerned and you love and. You know, if you can bring someone down here with you, great, bring them. But at least you come to the altar. Right? It's just unity. It's a time to cooperate. Let's be a church that's primed and ready. For a great move of God at the altar. We shouldn't be shocked when someone gets the Holy Ghost. We, that's what we're here for. We shouldn't be shocked when someone starts dancing in the Spirit. It's what we're here for. We should try. Oh, that was a great service. We should be a part of making every service amazing and miraculous because we're doing the part that God's called us to. Because Many of our altar services are just kind of short-lived. Some people just come stand, look around, feel all awkward, kind of at a high school dance and they got nobody that likes them. I say this because we can't allow the altar service to be a weak point in the church. If, if you call yourself a Holy Ghost-filled Christian, there ought to be something about you. I, 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 I'm not going to allow... My church will not suffer because I don't know what's going on. Anybody ever drive down the road and just see someone driving right and you're like, what are you doing? Everybody's at risk because you're on the road. When we're in here, everybody, everybody, everybody here, everyone here tonight, you are an integral part of what Souls Harbor does. God placed you here. He put you here. You can either be an asset or a detriment. It's all in your mentality. Everyone here is important to what God is doing. And every, no matter what your title is, no matter what your job is, no matter, everybody's called to be an altar worker. If you've got the Holy Ghost, if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, if you're a true saint of God, this altar is for you. It's for you to come up and help somebody and pray. It's up to you to help bring the power into this altar. I was in a church that had Revivals. I remember when revivals were Wednesday through Sunday. But I remember going as far back and having a 19, 19 weeks, 19 weeks with only Monday off. Mm -hmm. Today, and I want to hurt your feelings, but I can have a lot of evangelists. But the reason I don't is because y'all wouldn't come. If I had a revival from Wednesday through Sunday night, you hear what I'm saying? Because many folks just don't get it. But let me explain something. You know what sustained those revivals? Do you know why it was like it was? You know what propelled those revivals? The driving force behind those revivals. Listen, the singing was the same. We're still singing pretty much the same kind of songs. We're preaching sermons, and they're good, and, and you know, they're the same. You know, I mean, we're still preaching out of the same Bible, and we're just, you know, come on. It, uh, the thing that drove those services were the altar calls. It was that move of God. It was that moment when heaven touched earth, and we intertwined with divinity, and, and God moved, and, and, and people were healed, and people got the Holy Ghost, and amazing things. That, uh, you know, that, and there was nobody to sitting around. Everybody's jumping in and getting involved. We couldn't wait for altar call. I sat there. I used to run track. I know what is on your mark. Get ready. Get set. I'm there on that front seat. And it wasn't, I, oh, I got to get up there and repent. 
I wanted to get up there after what I just heard preaching. And I wanted it to look through my entire life and know and, and change me and affect me. And I wanted to be closer to, I don't know how you can hear the divine word of God preached from an anointed man of God in a house of God with a Holy Ghost filled people and be unresponsive. There ought to be something about us that we get lit on fire and we turn this world upside down. There was a mindset to come ready for something to happen. I remember, and I don't advise to do this, but you have to understand, here I am, a young guy. And the guy that won me was a younger guy. It's a big guy. And we lived in Fairfield, and we went to Brother Price's church in Napa, and I made that trip from Fairfield to Napa, going into the church in 11 minutes. I wasn't doing it because I had a 390. I wasn't doing it because it was fun to race fast. I was doing it because I didn't want to be late for church. 20 years old. You know, all these little things that seem insignificant all added up to me being here now. You take away one of them, am I still here? Let me put two things. If you don't have some of these things, are you going to make it to there? We have to wonder... About the, the Bible talks about the weights and the sins. How many weights? It's funny. We can drive hours in a car. We can be on the internet for hours. But we can't make it an hour and a half, two hours in a church without running to go to the bathroom. There's something here and here that needs fixed because it's, it's wrong. See, you ran up to the altar and you wanted to be there. And I remember... I, I remember I'd run up there, I, I, and I'd pray, and I'd get myself right, and then I'd look up, okay, who can I pray for? Who can I pray with? Watch someone get the Holy Ghost. Watch someone's life get turned around. Watch something amazing happen. Sometimes it'd be one person. The, the next night, it may be a whole family, but things were happening because the, we all focused on getting to that point with the altar where God would do a great move. In the Old Testament, fire would fall. The Old Testament, amazing. Well, the amazing things are still happening, but the problem is the enemy got you so busy. You're more concerned about looking at your phone. Or oh, I, 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 It's not that you got to go to the bathroom. You're just so inclined that this ain't important and you're going to go, or you got to go do this, you got to go do that, or your mind's over here. And the, and the amazing point moment that God is working for and the church is working for, the enemy's been able to convince you that you don't need to be concerned. Nothing like walking, coming to an altar where someone hasn't been to church in a while and they've been hurt, they've been wounded, and you pray, they get prayed through and they get restored and they get that place where God again and they get on fire. I'm thankful that every, every service is unique and every service and move of God is fresh and every, every altar service was amazing and the whole church would show up for revival every single night, every single service and we wouldn't miss it for nothing. Church needs to become the excuse you miss everything else for. And on honesty, and I'm thankful I got taught this. Every, every time there was an altar call, I was in the altar. I came to the altar. I, it, I'll be honest with you, I kind of miss those days. See, now I don't get, I, 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 I'm looking around to see when's the last time you were in the altar. When's the last time? I've been in this church for 10 years, and there's some of you been here this whole time. I never heard speaking tongues. I'm being pastor right now. You want to be me and stand before God? I'm going to say it out loud. You heard me. I'm concerned. The devil's real. Hell is real. There's a great move of God. There's amazing things happening. And you're more concerned about going to the bathroom or sitting in your seat or checking your phone. When's the last time you checked your spirit? When's the last time? Hey, you ought to make sure you don't come to this altar. Hey, husband, grab your wife. Hey, wife, grab your husband. Grab your children. Get them in an altar. Don't miss the altar. We're all altar workers. An altar in your life will alter your life. Knowing God 
gives us mercy every day. Fresh mercy, I want a fresh altar. I want to get that new experience at the altar every chance I get. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I never know what's going to transpire. In fact, to be honest with you, now that I think about it, I remember the service and where I was standing and what happened the day I was called of God. You know what happened? I wasn't sitting in the seat looking around at what everybody else was doing. I was in an altar. Someone laying their hands on me. Someone got their hand on my shoulder. People caring. It was in an altar. If you want to know why God just ain't the same with you, he hasn't changed. Get in an altar. Seek him. Search for him. He's here. He wants to anoint you. And he wants to light you on fire. That was the mindset to sustain those long revivals. That's, that's the mindset that caused us to have a powerful move of God. It's at our altar, folks, that our services will instigate and sustain the revival that we need to have today. It's at our altar that will facilitate the revival that we've got to have in our families, in our homes, at our jobs, in our own. We need our own personal revival. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen at the altar. If you love someone, don't let them sit by. Grab them by the hand. you got to get up here. It's different up here. There's something that happens at an altar in God. The altar service that transforms sets our services on fire. And it's our response that fuels the revival that we need. Between all the object lessons that we get and all the lessons and the excitement and the great Bible stories and the teachings and the meanings and the explanations and the revelations and the funny stories and the anecdotes of things that happen. We, we enjoy, we want all of it. But it's our response at an altar that makes the difference. It's, 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 it's where the fire falls. It's the altar where the sacrifice is placed. It's the altar that the life-changing commitment takes place. And we need to come running to the altar when we're called to come forward. It's time, oh no, I'm not, I, I've got to get to the altar. It's the altar where we experience the Pentecost. It's at the altar that separates us from all the other dominations. They don't even have altars in there anymore. They don't have altar calls. I, I, I read this guy's, a part of this guy's writing. Of, we don't need altars anymore. You don't need to make people feel like they got to go to an altar anymore. You don't need to do make people feel that way anymore. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for an altar. No wonder Christianity is so anemic today in the world. We got to cultivate and compel everyone to come to an altar because amazing things happen. Nothing else can compare or replace the experience of an altar. Most of us have heard Acts 2.38, right? Most of us have experienced the power and the plan of salvation, right? We got that revelation. But let me tell you something. When you see someone else get it for the first time, when you watch someone get baptized in Jesus' name, you know, you've been baptized for 20 years, but when you start seeing somebody, it does something to you. Because when they're getting it for the first time, it keeps it alive. It puts fire. It just stirs things up. When someone else experiences it for the first time, that's what keeps the revival churning and burning and blowing and going. Altar services that I remember, we when, when we prayed and prayed through, how many remember praying through? When's the last time you said, you know, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm sick and tired of being, I, I got a bad attitude. Yeah, I was done wrong. Why haven't I forgiven that? Or I've been ugly towards it. Why, why, why? Let me fix that. Let me, and, you, and you've been down at the altar for, you know, whatever time it takes. And you walk up and you love everybody. And you care about people. And your faith is restored in God. And you're not walking around some bitter old bitty negative about it. You walk up and all of a sudden you're a breath of fresh air. And you're joy and you're thankful. And you're just amazing to be around. That's what God does for you. Altar, it's amazing. There, there's nothing else like it. 
You can pray through to a new anointing. You can pray through to a new joy. You can pray through to a new level of commitment. You, it's, it was when I was praying through, that God called me. And I felt that. I remember exactly what happened. And there was two people there that were very important to me. And I'll never forget what I felt and what I said. Thankful for the altar. It's a place where we, we prayed and prayed with each other and prayed until we were different and, and we prayed until whatever we needed, we got. We prayed until we changed. When's the last time you prayed until you changed? When's the last time you prayed and got in the presence of God and he could come in there like, like a spiritual car wash and just wash all of that away? Mm. The altar is critical. It is a transactional act in the kingdom of God. It's the vital moment of experience that is the purpose of all that we came for. That the altar is that place to complete that God transaction of salvation, of repentance, of change, of restoration. It is that place of agreement. Paul stated in Acts 20, 27 to 28, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the all the counsel of God. Listen, I've told you all of it. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Everybody say, that's me. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you over. How many know you need the Holy Ghost today? They need it then, you need it today. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased. Everybody say purchased. It's a transaction going on in here. Yes, with his own blood. That move, that moment, we all look, man, uh, man we, we want to see people get baptized. Yeah, but what are we, what, are, what are us being around? We want to see them get the Holy Ghost. And I don't want someone to tell them. I want them to get it so good that they tell us they got it. Can I get an amen for some ministry around here? Uh, you ought to be that way with everybody in here, too. Hey, when's the last time? It's the receipt. Look what happened. And suddenly there came a sound, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. That place of a designated altar, the transaction was accepted because all of a sudden, when the repentance and the time in prayer was given, when it was all accepted, there was a sound. I'm going to have Ezekiel place them. I want you to listen to this sound. Sound is important. There, I can keep talking if you tell me when you're ready. I told him to have it keyed up. But. Just listen. You know what it is. First one to raise their hand, I'll ask you. Are we going to get it tonight? Anybody ever been to the big box stores? Costco, Sam, Walmart? Yep. All these stores have signs. They put out newspaper ads, internet ads, Facebook ads, giant road signs. We see them everywhere we go. Huge parking lots, beautifully striped. I really noticed that because I know what I wanted for us. There's air conditioning in the building. There's shopping carts for your convenience. Nice, neat rows of merchandise. They got staff. They got workers and greeters, managers and regional managers, all for one thing. I need the sound. Oh, let me see if I can. I'll see if I can do it. What is that? What is it? Who said that? Who said check out? Who said check out? What does that mean? That was what all the parking lot is for. All those signs, all those advertisements, all those nice, all those workers in that payroll. 
are for that one sound. You take away that one sound. You take away that transaction and the whole thing falls. That store falls, that store shut. Without that sound, without that transaction, we're all wasting our time. I'm telling you, the church needs the sound of an altar of people getting the Holy Ghost. Just like that store needs that sound, we need altars that are on fire. We need altars that got the sound of people praying, getting filled with the Holy Ghost and repenting and getting on fire and worship. We need that sound just like they need that sound. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's vital. It's important. It's the lifeline. The altar is not something to sweep under the rug and ignore. It is the focal point, just like that store. It's all about getting you to that one cash register. The altar of their transaction. Beep, beep, beep. Purchase, bought, boom. That's what it was all for. Don't think they're just bypassing the altar. You can't. It's where the transaction, the most important transaction, takes place in the kingdom of God. It's what the church is here for. You ought to ask yourself if that's the most important thing, how often you hear. I would suggest to you that right here in this church, where we put all the effort around this church to witness, to go on outreach, our, our Sunday school outreach, our church outreach, our yard maintenance, all, all that. You know what? We don't need those trees or the lighthouse or the parking lot. If we don't have this transaction, if we don't have this, I don't care how clean it is. I don't care how nice it is. It's all worthless without this transaction. We got to get on fire and make sure that we have the transaction of the altar taking place at every service. You got to be in the altar. You got to be a part of the altar. You got to be a part of that transaction. All the music and all the prayer, all the fasting, preaching, and Bible studies, and then to neglect the altar, that critical sound that needs to take place, that critical sound that is indicative of a Pentecostal church, the altar of a spiritual transaction, that sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, And it appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That all-important sound from that all-important place of a new soul repenting. The sound of somebody getting baptized. The sound of somebody repenting. Of someone getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody being refilled and restored. And someone getting getting forgiveness or getting mercy. Or somebody, the, the sound of someone being healed. Because if you ever take that away from us, we're done. If we don't, if we don't have an altar service, we're finished. We're, we're, we're no better than all those that don't preach about the Holy Ghost. We're, 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 are you hearing what I'm saying? This is the place of the critical transaction. You've got to ask yourself, are you running from the altar or are you running to the altar? It's where lives are changed. It's where hope is restored. It's where new beginnings are made. It's where hearts are mended. Marriages and families are put back together. It's where drug addiction is broken and alcoholics find deliverance. It's where thoughts of suicide, are you hearing me, get cast out. It's a place with renewed hope, peace, and mercy. It's the born-again experience right here. It happens at an altar. It's the birthplace of miracles, and we got to have it in every service. Every soul needs to walk down to this altar to receive a miracle, a miracle that it needs. It needs an experience. It's a transactional place that God created, an altar still important. It's up here that the broken, the weary, the wounded could come to. And there will be another person here. You, a person of faith, a person of prayer, a person that can lean over and come down and reach over with a gentle hand and lay hands on someone in need. It's a place where the battle weary can find a faithful, praying saint of God to push aside all the urgency of the day and take a few moments with someone who needs that transaction? Oh, that we had some people to work the checkout. 
You see, they want to go to machines and get the personal on the side. And some of us sit back there instead of coming up here, just like those stores that are, you know what, I don't, if I, there's someone working a lane, I go to that one instead of the machines. I want to talk to somebody. I want to look someone in the eye. There ought to be something about us when we come. I want to be with somebody. I want to work with somebody. I want, I want to help somebody. I, 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 want, I want, don't take the personalness out of church. Come to a place where someone's praying. Come up here to a place where some sweet lady in the church can come up and care and be a friend. Someone who's been fasting and seeking the face of God can come up and have a word of God for you. The altar is a place to get the answer for your most desperate need. The altar is a place where you find people that came and have already filled this house with prayer. All gets up. I want someone to come lay hands on me that's been here for a prayer, that's always here for a prayer, that's not just faithful to church, but they're faithful to the kingdom of God. They've already walked this carpet prior to service and filled this place with faith. Those that have spent countless services praying in these very same altars because they're primed for a miracle. Oh, give me somebody like that. Somebody up here is going to lay an anointed hand on you and you're going to get your miracle. That's why it's so important to have an altar. It's so important to be a person of prayer. It's so important to realize that every facet of the church, from pre-service prayer to worship to announcements and offering and the preaching of the Lord, all culminate at a moment of transaction right here at an altar. Don't bypass the altar. We need altar workers. We need people that love the kingdom of God so much they roll up their sleeves and say don't bother me I'm going to church for prayer I'm going to be there a little while isn't it funny with thing people I wish people put their phone down when they're at work I wonder how much eternity that'll matter I wish people put their phone down at church don't bypass the altar don't overlook the value of an altar you can come down here with whatever you're facing. You can pray through. I can't tell you how many times I just needed to get myself to an altar. Not that I'd done anything wrong. There's a few times I did. But I just needed to get there to get back in the presence of God. Kind of like just, I just got to get my wheels aligned again. I got to get my head. Just something about. And I'm telling you, if you don't, if, if it's few and far between, I know there's something jacked up in your life jacked up. You, know, you can cover it up with a nice dress or a nice suit, a nice tie, but deep down, I see that little bit coming out of you that an altar would fix it. Anybody experience what I'm talking about? How just coming to an altar kind of fixed me. Kind of got me straight a little bit. Oh, come on. Y'all y'all, y'all been married to some man. I just wish they'd be in an altar for five minutes. How many remember that old song? It's real, it's real, that Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. You can come down here weary and leave refreshed. You can come down here lost and leave found. You, you can come down here broken and leave whole. That's what the altar does. That's what it's for. The altar is the right place for that critical transaction that you need in your life. We need an altar call to culminate every single service. We need an altar experience to complete that all-important salvational transaction. Look, if the Bible says and it tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, do you think it's leaving out the altar? Hebrews 10.25, go look at it. If we're not to miss church, my God, why would we bypass an altar? The altar is the location that marks the fulfillment. John 4 and 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You see, truth is preached, and the spirit bears witness of that transaction. It takes both of them. We need both. We've all seen people get touched. We've seen them have, oh, my God, great move of God on them. And they leave and they don't come back and we're scratching. How many have been scratching? I don't get it. They got such an amazing touch of God. They're weeping and they're crying. They're like, what? They don't come back? You see, 
They got the spiritual, emotional touch, but they didn't get the truth side. And so they go right back to what they were doing because you have to understand. Now listen, it doesn't mean it wasn't real. And it doesn't mean it wasn't God. They had a spiritual experience. They feel emotionally better. There was a spiritual door open unto them. The problem is they're not thinking differently. Did you hear what I said? They struggle because they have had a touch, but they aren't thinking differently. So since their mind has not changed, their actions don't change. Y'all know someone comes up, oh, forgive, repent, sorry about that, and they go back to the same thing. Their mind didn't change. I remember years ago, I had a very, very elegant, well-to-do lady came to the church. And I'm preaching, and you could solely start hearing her gentle amen. Amen, that she started to understand the doctrine, understand the word of God. And I would teach a little more, and she'd amen again. And she was just very quiet and subdued. And she repented. I said, you needed to get baptized. So she got baptized. She was very formal. And so she got the truth and was converted. But she just was, she got the truth and just did it. But she didn't feel any different. She had the knowledge of the truth. I told her, you need the Holy Ghost. So she started seeking the Holy Ghost. Well, it wasn't long and she got the Holy Ghost. And now she had the knowledge and the emotional feeling of she getting the Holy Ghost. She, she, she got the spirit and the truth. And now she started worshiping. Now she start, things started going kind of uh, uh, apostolic Pentecostal. She came out of herself. She started witnessing. She started worshiping. She got involved in the church. She was in the altar. She was singing. She, 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 she had the whole thing, full-fledged apostolic. So she got the truth, and she got spiritually converted. See, you can know you're in the truth, but some of you need to get spiritually converted. And there's some of you so spiritual, we need to get you truth converted. I hear what I'm saying. It takes both. The way you feel and the way you think become fully converted. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. They may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. Listen to what he says. Here. Listen here. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, wait a minute, he's been following Jesus for how long? And when you're converted. See, it's not just a spiritual thing. It's a truth thing. And it's not just a truth thing. It's a spiritual thing. You need the whole gospel. You can't have all one and not the other. You've got to be careful with all these teachers and classes and all these things for this and for that. Let me tell you what. You don't need, you're going to get most of what you need at an altar, reading your Bible and getting the Holy Ghost moving in your life. Conversion is found in both spirit and truth. It's important to quickly know and understand who and what you're working with at an altar. When you come to an altar, some are spirit first. Some are truth first. Some take a while, some are fast. Some are timid, some are eager. Some will join right in and clap. Others have to be taught, oh, okay. And it's important that we're all different. We have these different things, but you have to understand the altar is the place of the transaction for everybody. Everyone has to move forward. Everybody has to come to an altar. Everybody has to understand that that change takes place. It's where all things become new. The secret of great revivals and a church having a revival is in the way a church meets seekers at the altar. Attitudes, actions, and motives when wrong can do more harm than good. What is an altar worker? An altar worker is an individual who helps or works with another person, teaching them how to respond to the Spirit of the Lord, how to respond to truth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And Ananias was probably one of the very first altar workers. In Acts chapter 9, the Lord told, go to Saul. In obedience, he went to Saul. And he told him, the Lord hath sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, the altar is the delivery room of the church. We witness. We teach Bible studies. We pray. We fast. We sing. We reach out to people, men and women and children, and we bring them to a place of commitment. Then, then 
and then we stand around. We're going to stand around and say, well, what do we do now? That's when we need an altar worker, man. We need to, we need to pray that through. I'm going to pray with you till you get the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray with you till you get that healing. I'm going to pray with you till this gets right. Yes, you need someone to teach you the Word of God, but you also need someone to show you how to operate in the Spirit. The altar workers are there to help. You just look around here. I'm so thankful, and I could call you by names. I know who the altar workers are in here, but understand, we all need to strive. Hey, young people, you need to be altar workers with other young people. If you see someone in your dynamic or your soul, Go over there and pray with them. It's good. It's going to help. Well, they, they, they're they going to look at you. Look, I don't need a, and you, Jacob, Aaron, you guys ever feel the need to come pray for pastor? You pray for pastor. But if I'm going through something, you're probably not going to understand the things that I go through at my age. But I've been there before. Now, Brother Joe can come up and pray for me. I'm like, he has an idea. Brother Davenport, Brother, Brother Christian, some of the other, you can come pray for me, you can understand. So it helps to have someone that you know understands what you're... A lady up here praying, probably, man, yeah, us guys, we'll lay hands and we'll pray, but I'm going to tell you another like a lady come up along and say, hey, sister, I got you. Oh, thank God for the sisters and the men around here that'll go right up to someone and say, man, I'm here to pray with you. You're not up here by yourself. You're not going... I, let, me, let me walk you through this. I've been here as well. So when a sinner or, or someone new steps out, goes to the altar, it's good that an altar worker comes up alongside them. Because the longer someone is in an altar by themselves, the more uncomfortable they'll begin to feel. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You ever walk into a building and you don't know where to go and people are just walking by you like you're not there? They just, that ought never to be in the church. That ought to never be in the church. Oh man, let me tell you. Oh no, the bathrooms are here. There's the altar. Here's the pastor. Here's the first lady. Here, oh, here's me. Here's Brother Joe. Here, here's Sister Crystal. Here, here's Sister Jessica. Now I'll, I'll say this. I thought this church needs that a whole lot. This is a pretty good church for that. We're, we're, we're a, we, are, we are a friendly church, and I'm thankful for that. But we never want to lose that. We're going to make sure anybody and everybody know who matter who they are. They walk in here, they know, hey, you're not alone. We're family. Don't stand back when there's an altar call and linger in your pew. Be encouraging. Be helping. Be there. There are going to be some that need more help than others. And it's up to us. It's our obligation to see that we're there to make sure their needs are met. Isaiah 23 says, Be thou ashamed, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth children. Oh, who's going to travail? Who's going to pray? Let's stand. I'm not finished, but I'm going to wrap this up for tonight. Listen, we need an altar if we become so unmoved. We do not care enough about souls. If you don't care about souls, stepping forward tonight would be a good thing for you. It's a critical time. It's important that we help, especially those that are new, to pray through to the Holy Ghost, to get to that place that they need. Because what the, Isaiah was just saying is if we're not doing that, we need to be ashamed. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Hey, sir. Hey, ma'am. Hey, young people. When's the last time you cared about your brothers and said, wait a minute, you haven't been up here in a long time. I love you too much to let another day go. You need that spiritual transaction. Yes? I remember years ago, I was about ready to leave the church. It felt like everybody was coming down on me like a ton of bricks. I was the sound man at the time, Brother Zeke. <laughs> oh, and I just, I just felt like everybody, Brother, brother he and I just felt everybody was just, And so I, I, I had come, I'd allow thoughts and ideas and feelings to take more precedent over me than the Word of God and the Holy Ghost. You need to hear what I'm saying. His Word is true. Let God be true in every man a liar. I was believing my own lies. 
Listen, if anybody, you ever find anybody say, hey, I don't like it, they done me wrong. Then don't you ever go to a restaurant, don't you ever go to a store. You go dig a hole out in the middle of the desert and call it and stay there. It's the only place you ain't going to get hurt by somebody else. Stop eating, stop doing it all. You're going to get church hurt. Not because it's a church, because there's people. Anybody ever get a bad meal at a restaurant? Did you stop eating? Anybody have a bad deal with an auto dealership or a car? I remember I bought a brand, you know, Sister Karen, it's important for a young man in their 20s. I bought myself a brand new pair of low-profile inky rims and some Pirelli tires. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But that part does. Back in the 80s, man, I got me a, I got me a little 200 SX. I got me some inky rims on there. Sweet little low-profile Pirelli tires. Yeah, a couple of 15-inch woofers in the back. What? I could rap back then, too. Don't even ask me to. I'm going to rap. I can barely rap packages today. I was involved in, I, oh, man, I had a computerized system in there, a couple of little, you could hear me coming from miles away. I was bad. We ain't got them rims. I'm going to go, I'm so excited. I'm going to go pick it up. Go out to the car, and I'm going around checking out the rims. Man, they look good. It looked good on it. Oh, yeah, man, I'll be styling. I'll be styling it. And I looked down at the back driver's side, and, and the, the center emblem was just off a little bit. Wait a minute, that ain't on right. And I went down to put it and the guy followed me out there, which what I thought was kind of weird. And when I grabbed it, it fell apart in my hand. Now, I was in church, but I was new. <laughs> Oh, I was in my, y'all need to be gentle now. I turned around. I looked at that dude. I said, basically, you're just trying to steal from me, huh? Ladies, you have to understand, God called us to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting because we are the fighters in the house. Hey, ladies, you're not supposed to be the fighter. He is. If you're fighting all the time, get back in your lane. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Get in an altar. You need a transaction with the Holy Ghost. So I turn around to that dude and I look down. I was like, man, it's fixing to get bad. You don't give me some satisfaction right now. He said, calm down. I'm going to go back inside. It, I was so mad because they, I looked and they were all watching me, hoping I would pull out. Because once I pulled out, it was mine. A couple of thousand dollars in rims and these jokers were trying to. You know why I said all that? I'm still buying rims. I'm still driving a car. S stop using, letting the devil use church hurt or people hurt or imperfections as a way to not have a transactional walk with God. Stop it. That's the devil getting one over on you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If that dude walked, I wouldn't recognize. If that dude walked in right now, it'd be no big deal. I would pray with him. How can we get so bitter by the enemy where he wants that we would withhold a transactional operation for someone that desperately needs it? I desperately needed it. Anybody else ever desperately needed it? We ought to be people that recognizes not only its importance, but its value to each and every one of us. Let's Gently come forward tonight. When the Apostle Paul told the church in Galatia, he said it like this. My little children, of whom I travail and birth again unto Christ, be formed in you. He's saying, I'm praying for you. God needs to be formed in you. You're not going to do that with one prayer 50 years ago, 20 years ago, five weeks ago. It's going to be repeatedly coming to an altar and having that, 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 that transactional relationship with God where you trade yourself for him and you, you trade your ideas and your attitudes for, for him and his anointing. He said, I see God for you because I want you to become obedient to the Spirit and the presence of God. 